So today, I want to give you three simple points, and we're going to prepare our hearts for this week, prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. But in order for you to prepare your heart, we have to understand what the Scripture says. We have to understand that when Paul is communicating to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to read a few of these verses, but we're going to start at verses 23 through 25. We have to understand there's some words that, when I read the scriptures, here's what I like to do. I like to read the scriptures, and, and there's certain words that pop out, and I want to know what those words mean. I want to understand, is there a purpose for that word, and do I understand what that word means? And any time that I read scriptures, you know, a lot of those things are great, but I, I, I don't want to just read. I want to understand. I want to understand what it means and, and try to apply what it means to my life. And let's look at verses 23 through 25. The first one, you are here to remember Jesus. That's our first point. We are here to remember Jesus. We're not here for any other reason today at the Lord's table other than to remember and reflect of what Jesus has done for you. Let me, under, let me teach you that one. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on that same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same hour, in the same manner, he also took a cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. There's a lot of stuff in there, but the word that pops out to me that I have to understand is remember. Do this in remembrance of me. So I started looking at the word remembers, and in our vocabulary, when I use the word remember, I would say, oh yeah, I, I remember that now. Yeah, I, yeah, that's right. I forgot, but you're, you're right. This word doesn't mean just to remember. Oh yeah, there, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Yeah, th yeah, I, I remember in the Gospels what it talks about. It's not just to recall. It's to have a built-up passion within your heart, within your life. Such as this. The closest I can understand this and relate it to you is somebody that's dear to you. Somebody that you loved. Somebody that was so deep and you had a common bond with, that you had a passion for and a love for, they die. And every time that you remember their name, every time that somebody says a story that flashes you back to their remembrance, that is the word. When somebody talks about the cross of Jesus, when somebody talks about the crucifixion of our Lord, it is not something that we can look at and say, thanks for what he did. No, it's something that tears your heart up because he sacrificed his life for you. So the remembrance is not, I remember about Christ. It's a built-up passion within your life. Just like when somebody that's dear to you, when they pass away or they move away, and you think of their name and a tear comes to your eye, sadness overwhelms you. That is the built-up passion that we should have when we talk about do this in remembrance and thankfulness of what Christ has done for you. Do not take it in a, in a meaningless manner. Do not think about Jesus as something that he had to do. He has done it for you. And this week is a built-up passion within our life. Do this in remembrance of me. So when you think about Jesus, think about what he has done. Think about his life. Think about his prophecy. Jesus it is the purpose of our life. There's some scriptures that I, that I love. And the scripture I'm going to read now was written 800 years or so before Jesus died on the cross. 700, about 70 years before Jesus was born, miraculously. Lived a perfect life. Was rejected of men and betrayed was crucified and was put in a borrowed tomb of a rich man, was rejected, was crucified for you. And there's a scripture in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 53, reading, re read and written 800 years before Jesus was crucified. 
Let me read that. Follow along, Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our report? And whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness. And when, he is, when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he was born our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Look at verse 6, very important verse. What's the first word? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of who? All. Every one of us. We have all gone astray. And Jesus died on the cross for all of our iniquity. He was oppressed and was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is silent. He opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was put him to grief. Yet you made his soul an offering for sin. He shall not, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall not see the labor of his hands. And be satisfied by his judgment. I'm sorry, by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide his portion from the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That's Jesus. 800 years before Jesus died on the cross, Isaiah prophesied all those things were taking place. It was not by happenstance that Jesus was just a good man. And he had a following. This was God ordained. It was God's plan that his only begotten son would leave heaven and come to this earth, be born of a virgin, live 33 years. And die die for you for what purpose to take away the sins of all when we remember Jesus we have to remember where we were we have to remember what he has done and not take it lightly there's a couple things here I think he was counted nothing because of his lowly background Jesus was born of a young lady Joseph, the father, a carpenter in a little village that didn't have anything. Jesus was not a man of means, so he was thought of as somebody of lower class, lowly background. He was rejected because of his message. Because of his message, he was crucified because they said he blasphemed against God. He was bringing in a new covenant, a new message. It wasn't about the religious day. It was about Jesus dying on the cross for their sins. It was about repentance for their life. His message, they crucified him for it. And his grief is because of his mission. Grief. He had a purpose within his life. I remember in the scene that we're going to show next Sunday, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what his agony was going to be just in a few hours. 
The Bible says he sweat great drops of blood. He was in so much intense agony knowing what was going to take place. And I remember when I read that first time, I thought, he was just going to die. I mean, but it wasn't the death that he endured that caused the agony within his life. Many people were crucified in the day. A man being crucified was nothing new to the Roman Empire. People were crucified weekly. Many, many people were crucified. Thousands of people were crucified. So the crucifixion itself, in its own right, didn't save us. What saved us is when Jesus was in the garden thinking of what was going to take place, the agony of the pain of his body was gruesome. But the pain spiritually of taking on the iniquities, the sins of the world, dying for your sin and my sin, stretched between heaven and hell, that the agony of the spiritual condition of all mankind was supernaturally placed on his back. Whether you accept it or you don't accept it doesn't change the fact that he did it. Whether you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior or not, Jesus died and he took your sin upon him. And he said, that is my gift to you. That is what I have done. 800 years earlier, Isaiah prophesied it was going to take place. It wasn't just something that happened. Jesus did it for a purpose. He stretched out and he died. That should bring to us a devotion within our hearts, within our lives, that we don't just talk about a cross. We don't just talk about the blood. We just don't talk about the body of our Lord. It's something that has purpose and meaning. And when somebody says, Jesus, it should put a tear in our our eye and a, a spark within our heart and when somebody uses jesus's name in a way that is not reflective of the holiness of christ it should anger our spirit why it's because what he has done for you what he's done for me it's not something that we should take lightly it's something that we as children of god should take within our hearts if somebody would say something negatively about somebody that that has passed on before me that i had a passion for and they talk negative about somebody, you know what? You would stand up for your friend or for your family. You would stand up for somebody that you love, that you had a vision for and a passion for. So that's what we ought to do for Christ. We ought to stand up and remember him. And the second thing, we are here to preach until his death. We are here to preach his death. We are here to proclaim his message. We are here to share to everyone what we are all about. In verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The word show is proclaim, to, to preach, to, to announce, to not be ashamed. You are here to preach about Jesus. Because the key is Jesus was crucified. He died on the cross. He was put in the tomb. But you know what? A lot of people are buried a lot of people have put in a tomb. A lot of people are put under the ground. Just because you're dead, just because you took the sins of the world, Jesus didn't save us on the cross. You know what? He died. He was put in the tomb, and three days later, he rose, and he conquered death, hell, and the grave, and he has given us power, the ability to accomplish what God has called us to do, to have the authority to say no to this world, to understand that God's power was in us. If we live in our power, we fail every day. But when we put our life in God's hands, we have victory over the sin of this world. It's who do we hold on to? Do we hold on to us, ourselves, our authority, our knowledge, our abilities, our popularity, our resources? Is that where we get our identity from? And if we do, we're going to fail every day. But God has given us power through Jesus and the resurrection of his life. He died. He was buried. He rose again. And when he rose again, he had victory over death, victory over sin. And he gives us power 
to live our lives in that victory and in that power. We have to remember, and we have to proclaim that message that Jesus not only died, he was buried. And when he was buried, he conquered death. He conquered sin. He conquered Satan. And he has allowed us to have that same ability. So let's not take it lightly of what we're doing today. Because if we have our faith in Christ, and we have the power of his resurrection, and we have a church that proclaims his message, and you are the church, and we proclaim that message loudly and unashamedly, we can proclaim this last point. You are here to examine yourself. Here's the key. I'm not here to examine you. You're not here to examine me. The only person that we need to worry about is what does God see in you? Examining yourself means you're open and transparent before God. You can't hide anything from him anyway. He already knows everything about your life. What he wants you to do is examine yourself to, do you remember? Do you have a passion? Do you live in the power of his resurrection? Because there's a warning that Paul gives. And this warning is very strong. He's telling the early church, the guys, what you're about ready to do when you take the Lord's Supper, it's not your supper, it's not the church's supper, it's the Lord's Supper. And when you take that Lord's Supper, you need to be holy. You need to be prepared. Because God looks at this as a very intimate act of our worship to Him. You know, when we talk about that, there's all kinds of words about worship. And I believe we can worship when we sing, we can worship when we preach, we can worship when we pray, we can worship when we communicate. There's all kinds of ways to worship. But when we worship in this way, we are saying, I am accepting God's word as realness, as, as what he says. I'm going to try to transform and apply my life to adhere to what God has in store for me. Let's, let me read this. These are very humbling. It says, therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of our Lord. But let a man examine himself, and let him eat of this bread and drink of this cup. For he who eats and drinks of an unworthy manner eats and drinks the judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastised by the Lord, that we may be condemned with this world therefore my brethren when you come together to eat wait for one another but if anyone is hungry let him eat at home lest you come together for judgment and the rest i will set in order when i come he's just saying guys this is important we're not perfect we have the the will to sin and we do sin and when we sin, God is saying, I am here to take away your sins. We do have sin. We have things within our life. He's just asking us to come before God in a humble state and ask God to forgive us and remember what Jesus has done for us and put ourselves in a state of what we like to call holiness. Because if Jesus died... If Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, you know, all of your past sins and all of your future sins have already been crucified for, right? Jesus died on the cross for all sins and all iniquities. All of our sins are on the back of Jesus. He's already paid the price for your sin. Now he's saying, now you don't, don't live your life in sin because you can he says honor me with every part of your life and your devotion to me is because you love me 
It's because what I've done for you and the placement I'm going to give to you in heaven when you die. You can sin. And you can go to heaven with your sin. But your sin will hinder what I have in store for you into the future. So what I want you to do is I want you to come before me as often as you do this, as often as we take the Lord's Supper, as often as you think of Jesus, we should bow our heads and be thankful for what he's done for us and say, Lord, forgive me for where I failed you. Not because I have to be absolutely perfect before Jesus would love me. No, Jesus loves me unconditionally. But what Jesus wants is my heart to look at him, to remember what he has done, to refocus my life, to remember that today on the Lord's Supper Day is a day when I get off my knees before God and I look at him and I say, Lord, forgive me for what I've done for him. And I take this bread and I take this juice as a church body. What it should be, it should be just like that very first moment that you accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, and you felt the sin of this world, the sin of your life is broken off of your back and the freedom that you have in Christ, I am not guilty. And when we have that feeling within our life, we can take the Lord's Supper with a pure heart because we know that the sin that I had within my life is stamped free. I am not guilty. I have been forgiven. That is when we come examine ourselves is what Jesus is saying to us. He said, let me not only forgive you, but let me give you the ability to walk in my power, in my forgiveness. And when we come to the family together, when we partake, we're doing this as a family. Don't come in an unworthy manner. Don't take the bread and take the juice by yourself. Wait on everybody. Let everybody talk to God. Let everybody pray. Let everybody examine themselves. Make sure everyone that takes the Lord's Supper has truly been forgiven. And how do you become forgiven? Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That he died on the cross for your sins, all of your sins, your past and your future. He not only died for them, he was buried and conquered them, taken them away. So we have victory in Jesus. So remember examine proclaim his message this week is the easiest week in the world uh, the easiest week of the year to talk about jesus it's easter everybody's going to talk about jesus everybody's going to talk about the resurrection everybody's talking about palm sunday you know inviting them to an easter service this week should be so easy for us because we're we're going to proclaim something next sunday in song and in message that can transform somebody's life and give them a hope that they don't have. So this week when we take this Lord's Supper, preparing our hearts to walk into a week to proclaim the message of Jesus, proclaim his death and his power. So a very simple message, three simple points, but I think we need to remember who Jesus is. We have to proclaim and preach his death and his power over death, and we have to examine ourselves. So what do we do? Well, this is the most important part of the entire day, because this is the time where we examine. We ask our church family. We ask the body of Christ. If you are a child of God, you've already been bought by the blood of Jesus, we invite you to our table. We open up our table for you, what that means is you can come and partake of the Lord's Supper with us if two things have taken place. Number one, you're a child of God. If you are a child of God, and secondly, you are willing to come to the altar or sit in your chair and examine and say, Lord, forgive me where I have failed you. Lord, I need your help. I have strayed away from your path. Because I do not want to offer you something that's going to cause judgment upon your life. Jesus says, I am willing to forgive all of our sins. But what we must do is ask him, and he will do that. So, I'm gonna, we're going to spend a few minutes. And feel free to come on the platform or on the chairs or wherever you need to. 
going to have our deacons to come at the tables. And when we're done praying and examine ourselves, take a cup and a piece of bread that represents the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed for your sins. And then go back to your seats. And when we are all done, we will partake and pray and read scripture and partake together. Would you please stand? Doug, if you could put some music on, and we are going to partake at the Lord's Supper at this time by examining ourselves and being prepared for his table.
like to introduce our new deacon board. It was just for me and standing in front of you, have been elected by you to represent you as the deacons. And one of the offices that they hold is there's a couple things that are very significant. And one of the things that they are responsible for is the spiritual care of the body of Christ. I, I am your proclaimer, I'm your preacher. But the deacon's job is not to be my boss. The de deacon's job is to be a minister, to help minister in the body of Christ and to, to serve you. And this year, you elected three of these guys, and three of them were already on the board. And I wanted them to stand in front of you because we had our meeting this week um, about the job and the role of a deacon. And they all have a very sincere heart of wanting to take care of the family of God spiritually whether it's in the hospitals or whether it's praying for you or whether it's to encourage you spiritually whether even if, it, if it's just talking to you about certain things within your life these men are very capable and I believe can stand before you and present and represent the body of Christ represent me as a preacher and the staff but these men are very good and capable men. I want them to stand in front of you during this Lord's Supper to proclaim to you that they are here to be your servant, to be a witness. So if there's something that you need, a, a something that is a, a question that you may have that you don't or you can't share with me or you would like to talk to somebody, these men are being willing to be your representative from the body of Christ with me at this church. So the scripture says in verses 23 through 25, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of my new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we have this cup of juice that represents the sacrificial blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that when he shed this blood that this cup represents it is the forgiveness of your sin and his body which was perfect that knew no sin was the sacrifice of the perfect lamb of God just like in the Old Testament where they had to sacrifice animals for the forgiveness or the pushback of your sins this bread represents a perfect lamb of God that takes away the sins of the entire world. This represents the body that was broken for you. This represents the blood that was shed for you. Do this in remembrance of our Lord's sacrifice, his death, and his resurrection. Let's pray. Dear Father, forgive us where we have failed you. Lord, we thank you for our church. We thank you for the ability to proclaim your message of death and sacrifice and power. Let us never forget where we were. Let us never forget what you did. Let us never forget what you offer. And allow us to proclaim it loudly and often. Let us be the church that you've called us to be. Let us be the individuals that you want us to be being unashamed of the name of Jesus. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And then they partook together. Thank you for being with us on Palm Sunday. Pastor Al, if you can make your way up here. Thank you, men, for serving us today. This is always a very time, isn't it? To come and, as a body of believers, to partake of the Lord's Supper and to examine our lives. 
because this is Palm Sunday, and this took place during the week. And then on Friday, there's a crucifixion and there's a resurrection on the first day of the week following. And so don't forget, Saturday night we have a service here. Music and drama starts at 6.30. Sunday morning at 10.30. As we look at the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but I think more importantly is the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that we can walk in the newness of life. What a great time it is. Think of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Well, I don't know if we have any visitors here today. If you are visiting, you braved it. You were very courageous. We thank you for being here. And if you are visiting today, if you take one of these cards in front of you and chair, fill it out place this in the offering plate in a few moments. We'd appreciate it very much. We also have a gift for you. Go down the center aisle and through the doors and um, our guest reception area. I would also like to mention, maybe you've been coming to Glenfield for about a year since last April, maybe six months, maybe a few months. And uh, the first Sunday of April, we're going to have a lunch here just for you to come and to get acquainted with the staff, learn more about Glenville. And so keep that in mind. That's... Um, the first Sunday of April that will be over in the gym right after our services. And we want to invite you to that. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come. And I could not help but to think how much God has given to us. He gave us his son to die upon the cross. His son gave his life just for us. God has given to us the Holy Spirit to draw us to his son and then to enable us to become a child of God, to empower us to do so. He has given to us the forgiveness of sin. He's given to us eternal life. He has actually given to us his righteousness. He has given to us his mercy and his grace. And that should challenge all of us here to be generous like God is generous and to give a generous way. I have never, ever suffered what God and Christ has suffered in my giving, the giving of my life and the giving of my financial means. I've never suffered like that. But it does challenge me to think what God has given to me to be a giver. Not a taker, but to be a giver. We're going to receive the offering today. I pray that as you experience the Lord's Supper today, that God will have spoken to your heart and to my heart that we would be a giver of our financial means. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your son that has given us so much. Father, we thank you for the freshness of life the newness of life. Father, the gift of God loved the world so much that you gave us your son. And I pray, Father, that this week that you would use Glenville in a mighty way to invite people to come this Saturday night and next Sunday morning. And that, Father, we would see people come to know Christ as a personal Savior through the efforts of the drama, the music, the preaching of the word next Saturday night and Sunday morning. Father, thank you so much for this offering today. We are so grateful to you for what you have given to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The biggest connection that you can have with this church on Easter Sunday morning is not going to take place on this platform. Your biggest connection is going to take place with the person that's sitting right beside you that need Jesus and you inviting somebody and you asking the Holy Spirit to direct them watching this is going to be very entertaining and it's going to be very good but what's going to take place in the seat right beside you with the person that you invite to sit beside you is very important because the Holy Spirit of God can use a message of music and drama 
the transformation of what Jesus Christ can do within their life can be life changing. Life changing. Only if we are life changers. If we are not embarrassed to say, I remember what Jesus did for me. And because he did that for me, I want to give him the opportunity to do that to you. Remember what he has done. Don't take this week lightly. We come across people every day that are not spiritually where you are. They may not even like God. They may never go to church. They may be hurt, beat up by a church and be disillusioned by things that have taken place and have turned their back to God. But they're in a different place in their life right now. And they may just need us to fix by giving them Jesus. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Invite. Saturday night at 6.30. Sunday morning at 10.30. Identical services. If you come Saturday night, you don't have to come Sunday morning. If you come Sunday morning, you don't have to come Sunday night. Unless you want to be ministers and, and love people and help people, you're more than welcome to come. But I do ask this for our regular attenders. Now, if you're a guest, you don't have to do this. If you're a regular attender, next Sunday morning, we have permission to park across the street, especially if there's not seven inches of snow. You can park across the street, drop your wife off and the kids off, and park the car across the street in that parking lot, or all the way in the back, allow our late attenders, which is half of my normal church members, but our late attenders, <laughs> just saying, just saying, um, park in the back, and let our guests park up front. We ought to do that all the time anyway, just a hint, hint, but uh, especially on Easter. Park across the street or in the back and let people that come in late. What I would hate is somebody that is a non-believer to drive through our parking lot and have to park a half a mile away and say, you know what, eh, not today. I'll just skip today. And they don't get the opportunity to do what Jesus wants them to do and give their life to him. So let us be in, inconvenienced because we are the one giving the message. Let the one needing the message come in ready to have a clean heart. Okay? Thank you for being here today. God bless you. You're dismissed.